Hi, I'm Yvonne Chapman, and you're watching the Permanent Rain Press. Hi, everyone. It's Chloe with the Permanent Rain Press. Today, I'm excited to be joined by Yvonne Chapman. How are you? I'm good. Thank you so much for having me today. Thank you so much for being here. I mean, it's been a really exciting past couple of days for you. Uh, Wednesday, of course, Avatar The Last Airbender renewed for seasons two and three. And then just yesterday, it was announced that you are joining the cast of Superman and Lois in the show's final season. So has your phone kind of been, I want to say, like ringing off the hook, a lot of, you know, congratulatory <laughs> messages? Yeah, I've had I've had really lovely support from friends and family messaging. They knew a little bit beforehand um, about the Superman stuff, but those who didn't have been really sweet and, and just sending their congrats. So it's it's been a lot of love and I'm very grateful. Well, I know you can't really talk too, too much about it, but we will circle back at the end just about you joining the cast. I wanted to talk a bit about your unique background and a show that was near and dear to my heart, CW's Kung Fu. So starting off with your corporate finance background, you've now kind of traded that for a career in acting. I know you've always loved acting, but when you were younger, you didn't see it as a viable career path. So how did the arts really inspire and connect with you in a different way than with business? Yeah, I mean, I I think with the art side of things, it was just a form of expression that I just couldn't help but do. Um, you know, sometimes I, I kind of feel like it chooses you rather than you choose it, because it was just something that I always needed to do even, even when I was younger. So when I was younger, I, I would did school plays, but I also dabbled a lot in painting and drawing. I still do to an extent. I try to like flex that creativity side just because I have a need for it really. So I don't really know what it is exactly why I always gravitated to it, but I just do. And I think that's kind of the simplest answer to it is like, it's just a part of something that I need to do. I think that it's always, it's also nice to like have ownership over something new. Like you mentioned things like painting, right? Anytime that you can kind of just go out there and express yourself, which is maybe not always the same, um, if, well, let's say a desk business job. Uh, do you miss the corporate business world? And if yes, how so? Like what aspects do you miss of it? Yeah, sometimes I do. I think coming into the industry as an actor, you're essentially self-employed and you're working off of a model of being your own business is how I would put it. If we're talking about the business side of the industry. So having to do that, a lot of the time you are working by yourself. There is no feedback to, for anyone to tell you if you're doing a, good, a really good job in those moments when you are alone doing the auditions by yourself. I, the only feedback really you can get is if you get a call back or you get called back in by the same casting directors to read for a different part. And there's so many things that are completely out of your control. Um, so I do miss the structure sometimes of the corporate world. But then when I do think about that, I also love the how chaotic it is in this industry too. So I think there's facets of both that I really do adore. And then sometimes it'd be nice to have a bit of structure. And then sometimes I really love the chaos of it all. So it depends on what day you're catching me on, I think <laughs> what that answer might be. But if I had to choose something, maybe it would just be a little bit more of the structure of knowing where you're going. Because a lot of this being an actor is not knowing where the next gig is coming from, not necessarily knowing if the path you're going on is going to be the path or it's going to take a completely different direction, which can be scary, but also really exciting. Well, I know you mentioned in another interview that um, you, unfortunately, one of those business jobs, you were let go, but the universe gives us signs and you took that severance package as a sign to pursue another dream. And I mean, it led you to this current position and it's been pretty good for you so far and you have gotten a taste of the kind of business world in some of your past characters um, street legal family laws <laughs> another one so you did kind of get to to play into that side a bit definitely yeah yeah it was fun it was it was a nice way to lend both of my worlds I guess going into one well, you starred as Jalan in three seasons of the CW's Kung Fu, my favorite character for how she was developed over the seasons. What do you, you miss about her? 
I miss so much about her. It's always a sad thing to let go of a character when a show ends because you get so attached. You know, it's almost I it's almost like you become friends with this person who existed in in such a limited space in the TV realm, if if that makes any sense. What I miss about her is how much she's had to grow and learn. Um, and that's always something that I, I hope that I could do in my personal life. But for her, it was exponentially, <laughs> I, I would say, fast forwarded throughout the seasons because she had to, given the circumstances that she was in. And I really miss that idea of, of her and that aspect of her was, was really fun to play. I loved how she slowly became an ally to Nikki and Team Shubies with a common cause, but also a friend of the Shen family. So how much fun were those big group scenes at the Shen household to film with everyone and have Jalan be included because you kind of saw her um, start out as an outsider and slowly began to be brought into the fold. Yeah, I love, I love the whole cast. So for the first two seasons, and this isn't a complaint by any means because I absolutely adore and love working off of Olivia. A lot of the fantastic guest stars that we came on were a lot of, uh, were much part of um, Jalan's story. So I got to work with them. I got to work with Eddie a ton, but I never got to be in the actual family fold until about season three. And so when that happened and we're all good friends, I'm like, finally, I get to play with you guys on set because she never really got the chance. So it was a really, for it being the last season, it was a really nice send off for me personally to be able to work with all of my friends. So that was a big win for her and for me. And then by the finale, like, I mean, we learned that Jalan loves sweets, but she has like a nut allergy. So you have like <laughs> these funny tidbits because she is such a like a kind of cool hardened exterior so it was nice to see the banter of course you mentioned like with Eddie um, as Henry they kind of played off each other um, which was your favorite scene in the series to be a part of and why Ooh, I would have to say I think the prison break in season two episode two if I'm not mistaken that to me was such a ugh, such a fun thing to do the choreography for that was phenomenal um and I just felt like such an empowered badass like just breaking out of prison and beaming all the guards down and it was just such an epic reawakening of the character for me I think that was my favorite of all three seasons the choreography was so good um like a lot of the fight scenes the one that stuck out to me was um it was season one I think it was the after the museum gala uh between Jalan and Nikki but also because you two were fighting in such like beautiful outfits and it was just like you know but so many of Jalan's fight scenes she didn't even break a sweat and not a hair out of place the girl knows what she's doing <laughs> And some of the same team ended up like on Avatar as well, right? Yeah, they did. A lot of the stunt team actually went over to Avatar in season two. So I got to see them there as well. It was a nice crossover family. <laughs> the scene I just wanted to touch on briefly was the one opposite Vanessa's paling. Um, it was season three, episode seven, where they have that heart to heart about forgiveness and they kind of reconcile how special and important was that moment for you? It was great. I think it was really earned and needed for the two characters because we saw moments of them in their past trying to reconcile, but neither one of them were there. And it wasn't until Jalan, actually, in my opinion, grew up emotionally to understand the circumstances. Because I think for, for everything that's happened to her in her childhood, she didn't have the emotional maturity to understand what to do with that. And it wasn't until being integrated with a family, the Shen family, was she actually able to see that there was a different path and a different way for her, and then to look at family a different way. So that moment was really earned for the two of them to reconnect to sisters. That was so well said. And um, I'm curious, like, what were your thoughts on how Jalan's story ended in, you know, the kind of series finale and overall with how the series concluded? I really think that the showrunners did a outstanding job of wrapping it up um, because we didn't know if we're going to get a season four or not. And I, they wanted to give a gratifying and satisfying way to end the series for 
the fans in case that were not to happen. And I really think they did a beautiful job of it. For Jalan, it was bittersweet because Palin died, but that was, it had to happen, you know? It, it made a lot of sense for that to happen. But it would also have opened up a lot of stories for her too. Because the last, one of the last things she says in the show is, Nikki asked, well, where are you going to go now? And her whole agenda for the entire three seasons was to get back at Russell Tan, to save her sister. And now with those two things completely taken away from her, she doesn't know. And that's what she says. I have no idea. I don't know. So I think that opened up a world of possibilities for her, um, which is a really, it's a bittersweet, but it's also really nice for her. That I would say that I, I I think that's a really nice send off for Jalan because that she gets to explore what life could be now that she doesn't have this laser focus agenda of either revenge or somebody outside of herself. Now it's just her. If you were renewed for season four, like, do you know where Jalan's story would have gone? Like, did you have any discussions with the creative team? I actually have no idea, but there is a joke that was always on set uh for Jalan because she's <laughs> she's always seen in these extreme circumstances because she's an extreme character and I'd always joke with some of the crew I'm like what if we just had a mini spin-off series of like YouTube videos of Jalan doing everyday normal stuff like there she is going to the grocery store there she is going to the laundromat or paying her bills <laughs> so mundane but just so funny in my in our minds and not to say that was at all what would have happened but that was just a running joke on set of like what what does she do when she's not being a badass that's such a great idea I feel like you that should still be a project that should come to fruition because <laughs> you don't really think about that but I mean she's gotta I mean she's gotta eat can you imagine like someone coming in contact with her maybe like cutting in front of her in line at like the supermarket like how she would react it would be perfect yeah the inner dialogue versus what actually happens but I actually think that would have been interesting is to see her try to live a normal life but maybe things in her past come to haunt her because we actually don't get to see how she became one of the number one uh, assassins in the world we didn't we didn't really get to see how she acquired her wealth I think that would have been a really fun fun thing to explore is her trying to try to be by the straight and arrow but then other things have other plans for her well, never say never. I mean, maybe <laughs> one of these days you have to bring that character back. But I do have to say the gripe that I had with the series finale was that Jalan didn't get to say goodbye to Paling. It just like tore at my heart because your tears in that scene were so raw and real. And I feel like it was earned for her to meet her before, you know, she had to go. But unfortunately, only only Nikki got that sentiment. But oh, that was just so hard to watch her going up the stairs. Of course, we see it like in the, the sequence. But yeah, makes for good TV, though. <laughs> It definitely does. What did the series and character teach you about yourself? You mentioned the growth and learning earlier. So is that like the main thing for you? Yeah. And, you know, I think professionally for me, this is the biggest job that I had to date was the three seasons of, of a show and being a series regular on that show consistently for those three seasons. So I learned a lot professionally um, and I'm always going to be grateful for that because it, it's just the dream of being able to do that as an actor is to have a consistent job and a consistent character that you love. I, I mean, my cup runneth over, you know, I, I couldn't have asked for more. So. What can you say about the cast you worked with and the friendships that have come out of Kung Fu now that the series has concluded? It's the dream. They, they are lovely human beings that we still keep in contact with each other to go to work every single day and it is long hours on set, long hours. So it makes all the difference in the world when you're friends with the people that you work with, when they're friendly, when they're supportive, collaborative, and they were all of the above and more than that. So I'm just really astoundedly grateful at the people that they are and who they continue to be. And I hope that you know we, we stay in touch forever. It's, it was such a special time in all of our lives. 
I know that you and Ludi are still close. Rest in peace to Kerwin. <laughs> but I also know that, you know, when all this exciting news is coming out for you, like Tony, JB, Shannon are all leaving like comments of support. And did, did you get to reunite with, with Shannon when you were in LA? Yeah, yeah. We got, to, I, I went out for um, coffee and a hike with Shannon and Olivia. Um, and then Eddie was also there. So he joined us after the hike for the coffee and the food. Uh, and then every time I'm in LA, I try to reach out to them and see where they're at. It's tough because I'm in Vancouver, so I don't get to see them as much as I would like. Um, but we try to keep in touch as much as we can. Gavin's a sweetheart. He always messages me once in a while. So does JB and, and JP, um, <laughs> not to be confused with JB, I am actually going to see him this weekend because he's in Vancouver. So we'll be hanging out. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's so sweet. And that's something that I think was really evident with this cast is, I mean, you spent time together offset a lot too. And I know some of the cast who are more in LA, unfortunately, with you in Vancouver, but they still talk as well. So it's so nice to see. And I mean, fingers crossed for some kind of reunion in the future. Um, just to touch on the Vancouver BC film community, since you've been a part of it for 10 years now, since your move from Calgary, how has the community really uplifted and helped you grow as an artist? Oh, hugely huge um especially i have to give a shout out to the asian uh community here through vancouver asian film festival has been a massive advocate of us we also have a group chat and whatsapp of a ton of us who are asian artists of whatever different backgrounds that we just keep adding to the group i don't know i actually don't know how many people are in it now um but it's a way for us to share projects share ideas just keep in touch with each other they it's a lovely community here that is really uplifting and it's so important that we do that for each other we'll move into avatar the last airbender how was the premiere in la and tell me a bit about your red carpet look oh the premiere is so so fun um gosh it was it was just a wild time to be able to see everybody because i haven't been able to meet a lot of them until the premiere we've just been talking online <laughs> honestly with each other for most of the, most of it um and then my look i was wearing this lovely lovely dress uh by sylvia and i hope i don't butcher her last name trashi it's spelled t-c-h-e-r-a-s-s-i beautiful collection i actually i absolutely love her stuff um and it was just when i put it on i'm like oh this is it we just knew uh, Nora Foley, she was my um, stylist for that look. So she pulled the look. Nadia, who's actually from Vancouver, she was my hair and makeup, but she kind of goes between Vancouver and LA now. So it was nice to reconnect with her. So I got to use a, a Canadian friend for that as well. And like, it was just so nice to, again, meet everybody um, because so, so much of the time I'm like on Instagram just saying, hi, how are you? You did great. Can't wait to see blah, 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 blah. And then there you actually get to give these people a good hug and see each other in person. Um, it was just nice to celebrate with everyone because we were waiting a really long time for this to come out. It was been over two years, I think at that point, uh, since we initially filmed. So we were, it was highly anticipated for all of us. And we were just cheering in the audience when we were watching the film all together so it was a beautiful experience so nice and yeah the look was great I loved the coloring on the dress and like the little accents like the gold loop earrings um were a nice touch but yeah I was gonna say because it's such a large ensemble cast and of course you're kind of limited to the episodes that you work it on and you haven't gotten to meet a lot of them I know um I saw on Instagram like you met Mamona, Talia, Sebastian for the first time Tamlin Tomita which <laughs> might have been were you really excited I love to, her. to meet her oh I love her yes yeah talk about a gorgeous woman inside and out oh my goodness it was such a thrill to see all of them in person I was like kind of in awe honestly I mean, hopefully you'll get to see them more um, over the next like year or so whenever um, filming picks back up. But um, tell me about your relationship with Michael Goy and how he championed you for the role of Kiyoshi. Like what were his reasons and what did he see in you for this part? 
We had a great time working together on Kung Fu. He came in on um, season one, episode seven, which was one of my favorite episodes, honestly, of the entire three seasons. He directed that. And we just clicked as creators. Like he, he was so easy and collaborative to work with. I felt empowered by him to do what it is that I need to do as an actor on set. And then we just kept in touch from there. And then he came back. He said, hey, there's a role I think you'd be really good for. I didn't know what the role was until he's like, it's for Avatar and it's Kyoshi. And I was like, oh. <laughs> so he said that. I'm like, yes, I'm in. Who do I need to talk to? Um, and then I had a chat with Albert Kim, who is awesome. Albert is amazing. And we had a chat about the role. And I was lucky that they that they tapped me for it because I will always be grateful for it. The reasons behind them tapping you for it? Like, what were there any specific ones that they gave you? Um, No, nothing, re actually nothing really specific. But I mean, in the episode that I worked with, uh, with Michael on and Kung Fu, it was just a range of stuff, which was really nice uh, because Jalan was going through the motions with her uncle, um, this is the flashback episode with her and Pei Ling. So it was, it was, there was yelling, there was crying, there was me speaking in a different language while also having to be emotional. Like there was, it was really grateful that it was just a range of things. And I think maybe hopefully that that was something that he's like, oh, well, we could do that together. We'd have to do something similar for this role as well. So maybe that's what it was. I have no idea, but um, I'm just really thankful that he's, <laughs> he's asked me to do it. Yeah, well, clearly they saw a spark in you for it. And like you mentioned, the emotional range. I mean, Kiyoshi goes through it and we only see like a tidbit in this first season. I mean, hopefully more in the future. But um, I know that you were a fan of the animated series. You also read the Kiyoshi novels in preparation. So what specific qualities did you pull from the source material to aid in your portrayal of her? Yeah, um, well, I, I wanted to pay close attention to how she became the avatar that people see her as, because there's there's a, quite a huge time jump in my in my headspace from the novels to her being 230 years old, um, because the novels really explore the very beginnings of her avatar hood and her learning um, that she was the avatar and that tumultuous time to her actually becoming the avatar. And, and then there's a period in between that of where she meets Aang and everything, all that space in between. So I just wanted to honor what the idea of her was um, and also facets from the book. So there's certain things that I think are more of in her reaction to him would be necessary for the circumstances of the story and the story plot. So what was happening, spoiler alert, in episode two as Avatar Kyoshi was talking to Aang is that Kyoshi Island was literally under attack. And what tactics would she use that I've seen her do in the books and also in the fandom of the character to get him and propel him to action? So those were kind of the choices I made. I think that's so well said because like you mentioned, I mean, it really is how you embody the character and you want to do right by them but also like add in specific elements based on this particular story and how your character would react in different situations so um i think that the series did a really good job of you know mixing both the, like both of those approaches how about the physicality portion like what kind of stood out to you for kiyoshi and how you kind of wanted to embody her besides her tall stature I mean, the tall stature was a huge part of it, a huge part of it. And like they wanted to make sure that was right. So I was standing on a platform with platform shoes <laughs> being exactly seven feet tall. Like they measured it down to a T. It was awesome. That in itself makes all the embodiment of her so real because you read she's legendary and known for being that tall and what what did uh, Sokka say? I'm, I I can't get it exactly right, but I think it was like there's a big scary lady. <laughs> so there you go. I I think I think that was more than enough to get into the physicality of her. It made a lot of sense. I guess like hidden under 
like that whole dress coat was <laughs> this giant platform that you were on well yeah so I mean the, the we had um two two different skirts for it one was true to my height because I needed to do stunts in it to do some of the fighting and then the other one for the acting bit they made it so I was seven feet tall and they made the skirt a bit longer so that way it would cover the platform that I was on and also the heels I was in um they did a great job because no one's done the wiser which is great <laughs> I mean clearly I'm not seven feet tall in real life but I think people will be disappointed to, to hear that I can't hit all. I can't do it all. <laughs> I know you mentioned the discussion you had uh, with Albert Kim about Kyoshi's introduction. Um, can you share any other details about that conversation? Like, did you have questions that you wanted answered with respect to you know her purpose and those differences from the animated series? Yeah. No. We we he ran through um, the intention of when she would be introduced of why. We talked about the character itself. I, you know, we geeked out about the novels a little bit, just a bit of fandom between both of us. Um, and he just has such a respect for the original source material. He used it as his Bible to to create the series. And I think that really shows. Um, and uh, yeah, she it is a change from the original <clears throat> because she doesn't show up in that way. But I had, I'm really grateful that that happened. I, I loved how the scene turned out. Um, so yeah, that he, that was the conversation in a nutshell between me and Albert. In terms of, you know, that scene where she does kind of act more as like a mentor guide to Aang, because in the source material early on, that role is largely filled by Roku. Did you kind of have to think through and justify that? Um, no, because I think they did such a wonderful job of the storytelling that I, my job was to come in and make sure that I do the scene justice or to try to do the scene justice as much as I could. And again, to keep true to the story that they wanted to tell. And it was like a really good time because obviously those episodes are focused on Kiyoshi Island. And then of course we meet um, Suki and that village. Kiyoshi's history is a turbulent one. And although we don't see it play out in season one, like what aspects were you drawn to in her past that shaped who she became as the avatar? She has had, like you said, a very tumultuous past. Um, it's actually quite heartbreaking, a lot of it. The I don't want to ruin too much because I think for anybody who hasn't read the novels yet, it's a really delightful read. Um, so I highly encourage it. But what I will say is that she had a really difficult childhood and understanding who she was as an avatar. I think what's really fascinating is her demeanor of who she was as uh, a younger adult. <clears throat> She's seven feet tall, but they describe her as someone who's really shy um and reserved and that's a really interesting thing to think about as someone who physically takes up a lot of space but tries not to take up a lot of space mentally or emotionally in a sense um so I was really drawn to her in that and then her coming out of that way of being because the avatarhood propelled her to she had to and what that looked like for her um was really interesting to read so don't want to give anything too much away if someone hasn't read the books yet. But anyway, I highly recommend them. They're great. Yeah. And I guess like you mentioned the journey, I mean, she was accepted as an avatar um, at age 16, but it did take some time uh, for that to happen. Like, I will put like a little bit of a spoiler disclaimer if you can say anything, but like, how did you understand her relationship with her parents? Because um okay spoiler alert for people but despite their abandonment like her signature avatar look it kind of pays tribute to both her parents and their past and her time with the flying opera company mm -hmm. well okay I won't give I don't want to say too much but I think my understanding of that was she didn't she had no idea what was in what was left from her of her parents until much later on when she I think if I'm getting the timelines right, meets the flying opera company and understands what what it is that they actually truly left her and who they were as people. And there's one particular character who uh, describes the reasoning in his opinion because he was so close with her parents 
why he thinks they left her in the in the way that she they did. And it's always that's what's interesting. It's always through someone else's perspective that maybe we get to understand a little bit more even about ourselves or the, the circumstances of our lives because she rightfully so she was left with no answer so she didn't know and then when she when she saw and met people who were so close to these to her parents did she start to understand who they were so i'll leave it at that <laughs> That's so true about, you know, another person's perspective. Sometimes you just need someone else there um, with that knowledge and it opens up a whole, you know, new world of possibilities and then questions and answers. How did you interpret the effects of her heavy makeup on her character? Like, was it a combination of war paint as an intimidation tactic, but also paying homage to her, her roots? Yeah, I think both. I mean, for me, my interpretation of that is because when she was at the beginning of becoming the Avatar, in a sense, and this is just my personal take of it, having projecting my own feelings about what we have to do in the world, is you wear a lot of different faces in order to get a certain certain outcome, certain job done. And it, there was this really fascinating talk I was listening to recently where it talked about um, alter egos. So we all we all know that like Kobe Bryant had his alter ego, Beyonce has Sasha Fierce. In my in my interpretation, that that was almost like her alter ego. She could put on that war paint and become the avatar and do what she needs to do because it helped her become who she felt that she needed to be in order to get certain things done. Um, so that's how I felt about it. That's a good way to put it. And I like like the whole mask idea, you know, red also like as a symbolism as a color it's like it's success and courage so there could be a lot of different factors that also went into the coloring um tell me about your time in the hair and makeup chair and recreating that look with Rita and Julie like how long were you sitting there um in the mornings how long did it take to get all the makeup off at the end of the day it's gonna sound long but they are such wonderful women it was so fun to sit in their chair even if it was for two and a half three hours that was the that was the initial time that it took but then they got super efficient at it and it pared it down um I can't recall what the end time was um but again there's just there's such a joy and just to sit and talk with them and look at their process of what they're doing and their artistry was just fun for me so it was great. <laughs> like they, they were so meticulous because they needed to get it really symmetrical. So they had pieces for every eye um, that were cut into the shape of what they wanted it to be. Um, I haven't shared the photos yet, but it was really funny when you take off the makeup. It's just like this red and white kind of abstract painting on my face <laughs> that I have on my phone. Um, but it, it was just a great time from beginning to end with them. They're amazing. So I imagine the first layer is like the, the cleansing balm or the oil or something like yeah. that. And then from there, you need like to really like deeply cleanse it off. But they helped I me with it. I will like that. That was them as well, because they, they had a special um, cleanser. Like you said, there was a layers of it, towels kind of doing that, wiping it down. Um, they helped me. <laughs> I didn't do I didn't have to do that by myself. <laughs> amazing work by by the hair and and makeup team and I know a lot of people say that that's like one of their favorite parts of the day because the people that you kind of meet and like you mentioned you're there for like two three hours so you have to kind of become friends with them and find things to talk about oh they're great they're really great and your costume designer Farnes, she posted a short Instagram video of her sketches and how the Kiyoshi costume came together. And everything was so intricate from the headpiece to the detail on the armor and the waistband. Were you a part of the design process at all? Or did you get like sneak peeks um, at your fittings before the costume was finalized? Um. So no, I wasn't part of the process, but oh my God, did they pull like pull it off, didn't they? It was she is phenomenally talented that whole team and there are they are fans of the show um so you could tell there was a lot of love that was put into every single costume that she did it was incredible um <clears throat> so when i went in for my first fitting it wasn't completely done but all the pieces were there just not entirely finished but even then we were still emotional because we're like wow this is not done yet and it still looks 
amazing. <laughs> so we did um, the hair makeup test, the costume test, sent that off. Um, but it was, man, it, it was so cool to step into that costume. And you, you've mentioned before, like, there's always something so magical about putting on a costume for the first time and how it kind of gives you that extra power in your scenes. Yeah, yeah, it completely, it changes everything. It changes the demeanor of everyone. Um, it's it's similar to, you know, when you put on something that makes you feel otherly, another another person, that's that's what it was. It's, it completely it allowed me to inherit her. What elements of the Earth Kingdom and its nation spoke to you? The elements? What do you mean? Um, maybe just like in terms of the culture, the environment of the Earth Nation, the food maybe. Oh, you know, I really loved seeing the Kyoshi village. They built out that whole thing and walking through that just felt, ah, uh, you just felt like you were transported into avatar it was astounding the the set design so i loved all those elements and then i i never got to shoot it but i absolutely loved boomy loved him his performance was unreal and then i saw screenshots of him doing his thing i'm like i've been a fan of his for a long time too he's great but um i really loved that whole set design as well in terms of the Kiyoshi village and like the island set, I mean, what kind of aspects um, spoke out to you when you were walking through the set? Was it um, like what kind of set decoration made it special? Well, they had all of the the homes there of, of the people who lived there. The, the attention to detail was all there. And you, you, you never really saw it inside the homes, but they made sure there was stuff in the homes. You could have walked in there and, and swore that somebody was living there in some of them. So, I mean, that's incredible, right? You almost uh, could have fun. stayed on set just so you could have stayed I, in Kyushu yeah. for a night. Yeah, totally. There were full-on homes built in there, so it was great. You voiced the intro for episode one. I mean, what was it like when they told you that you would be having that task? And like, for you, what did you focus on in the dialogue and in your delivery and intonation? I was thrilled when they asked me. I was surprised. I was surprised because I, I didn't, I wasn't expecting that at all. But what was really nice is that, again, Michael and Albert, they are to thank for honoring the source material. Um, they really, really took it to heart to make sure that this was a fresh um interpretation of, of the the original source material that was honoring what it was um and part of that was like well you know initially it's Katara doing it in the original we want to keep it a female voice Avatar Kiyoshi has been around for 230 years she would be someone who would know what was going on um so it made sense to have her is how they put it to me and I'm like I absolutely would love to um, and then we just, we played around with it. We, we did a ton of different takes of like intonation, different things. Um, yeah, we, we got to play with the intro to see what we wanted to, it to come out to be. Well, it turned out really well. I know I was looking through like X um, when the show came out and people were saying they felt chills listening to it. So especially because, you know, a lot of it, it was just the audio portion. It's nice to know that you also have a future as a voice actor, maybe <laughs> doing voice. I would love to. I mean, I can get you. You won't hear in that intro, but I could get real silly. <laughs> I would just love to be really silly on something. Um God, if you could hear me at home, <laughs> it's like nonstop, just craziness. But yeah, that would be fun. <laughs> I'm guessing for that one, you felt the weight of it and you're like, okay, I have to be in the zone and like yeah. super serious. This is like the intro for the entire series. Yes, yes, to say the least. I Because I'm, I'm a huge fan of this too. And to say that it was nerve-wracking and exciting is an understatement because we just all really wanted to do it justice we love the original cartoon in the original series Aang's past avatar lives they 
approach him with, I would say, a bit more compassion and understanding, <laughs> less blame. Uh, so take me through the scene um, in episode two, opposite Gordon uh, as Aang, and kind of thinking about you know how she responded to him and interacted with him. Yeah, I mean, I think there's a lot of things that she was trying to get across to him about um, the Avatar hood. Now, the part where, again, where she shows him a little bit more tough love is because of the circumstances of what's happening with Kyoshi Island and what's going to happen thereafter if he isn't ready or willing to be the Avatar. Um, and again, I think it's it, it's a subset facet of her and there could have been other approaches, which would have also been really true to Kiyoshi as well, as, as we've seen from the books and, and other source material of her. But given the circumstances in the scene, I felt that was the right tactic to use for her that would prompt the appropriate response for him. Um, I also do want to say that it was coupled, too, with a bit of her own projection, because if we know anything about Avatar Kiyoshi and where she's come from, it was she had a hard time accepting her avatar hood too at points and it didn't do her any good so it's a little bit of a projection of what she's had to go through in her past onto the adorable ang <laughs> in that scene but again i think it was appropriate for the circumstances he was so you know he's just so young and inexper inexperienced at that time so I really love seeing how like the different avatars interacted with him um, throughout the season it was nice to see um, what was it like sharing that scene opposite Gordon as a scene partner I mean fellow Vancouver right had you known him prior I think he was only like what 12 years old when when yeah. you filmed that I mean Gordon's a badass he's great he he's the, he, look he's a real deal for anybody who's who I don't know who would be but anyone questioning the kid is the real deal and like so talented so professional so kind so warm he he was wonderful to work off of I would work with him any day everyone saw him on Jimmy Jimmy Fallon was it so much yeah. charisma I mean he he already put it out there that he wants to host Saturday Night Live so he should he'd be hey, great maybe, at it <laughs> um in the near future maybe seasons season two kind of thing that would be really cool to see yeah, I hope I hope every bit of success for him. He deserves it. He's a good person. You have this very cool, visually nice looking sequence. Uh, first saving Katara from Zuko, then Kiyoshi Island, Kiyoshi Village from Commander Zhao and the Firebenders, where she utilizes all the elements. Take me through the choreography for that scene and what you saw when you were on set filming. Yeah, the choreography was actually a lot longer than what we saw on screen, but I think what they used was great. Um, and what I saw on set was a big blue green screen. <laughs> um, however, what they did show was the the Im embossed. How do you say that? They imprinted what what the scene would look like on the screen, so I'd be able to kind of see the atmosphere of it. And it was done in two parts, so. Um, a chunk of it was done in the blue and green screens. And then also part of it was done in the actual Kyoshi village itself. So it wasn't hard for me to imagine where it was because I, I had already been there. And then they described to me what would be happening around. I actually didn't know that in the circle, the tornado would be all four elements. So that was a surprise when I watched it. It was a really good surprise. I always find it fascinating because, I mean, as a viewer, we have the privilege of seeing everything when it's all put together and with the sound. Um, but for you, it's like, how do you create that intensity, like when you're working with the blue and green screens? Yeah, I just imagine. It's just imagination. <laughs> That's People flying everywhere, things flying <laughs> everywhere. <laughs> yeah, it's fun, though. It's great. It's a good time. Tell me about the formation of Kiyoshi Island and the Kiyoshi Warriors. Like, what were your thoughts on how Kiyoshi's legacy was reflected through them and this sacred place? It was beautifully done. It was beautifully done. And the costuming for the women who were the Kiyoshi Warriors, their story, I loved um, Tamlin's, um, her introduction to this story was beautiful and such a great addition because her kicking ass like chef kiss it was so good their whole fight sequence I absolutely loved and it was so well done 
Which was your favorite scene in season one and why? So a scene that Kyushu was not in. Um, I really loved, and this probably just goes back to my sappy nature, but um, the funeral scene of Iroh's son and showing that beautiful connection between Iroh and Zuko they are two of my favorite characters from the original cartoon. So to see that development um, of them was just so gorgeous. And I almost feel like choking up right now, but I definitely cried throughout the whole thing. <laughs> they had so many amazing moments, like a lot of heavy heartedness, but also some lighthearted moments as well. You know, Iroh kind of has to deal with Zuko when he's being like, yeah. for lack of better words, a little whiny. I know the the scene that's circulating is when he turns around and he's like, he ran. <laughs> I love that scene. Dallas, I mean, Dallas killed it throughout the entire show, but the intonation of that was so perfect. It was just perfect. Um, but yeah, they do. They have, they have a really, really great uh, time on the show and, and, and it shows, right? Now that we know the show is coming back to kind of finish off the story in seasons two and three, uh, should you return, what would you like to see or explore with Kiyoshi? Ooh, well, it would have to, it just has to make sense um, to serve Aang's story. I, I'm always been saying like, this is the era of Aang and however Kiyoshi can participate in that, I'll be happy with. I think it's one of those things where you're kind of like, oh, you'd love to return, but obviously it's not up to you, but you also don't want to force Kiyoshi on the story if she has no place. Um, I know another idea brought up is like a spinoff series. You could really do one for any of these characters, but yeah. for Kiyoshi, like what would that look like to you? Are there any particular parts of her life that you would like to explore further? Yeah, I mean, I would love to see <clears throat> the rise and shadow of Kiyoshi come to life. I think it'd be really interesting to see who she was um, after the books and then flashing back to the books of her developing as the avatar and then seeing who she is in her full on power would be really great. Um, <clears throat> so sorry, I'm going to have a little bit of frog in my throat, but that's what I would love to see because there's so many characters from those books, it's particularly the Flying Opera Company and Rangi that I mean you have to have you have to have Kyoshi and Rangi there's no if ands or buts about that um if I if we got that that would be amazing but I haven't heard anything I don't know if it, if, if if it would happen but I as a fan would love to see that I feel like you would have a lot of backing on that <laughs> as well um people would love to see more and I, I think something interesting would be the Dai Li and kind of how that yeah. came to to form as well yeah, for sure. That's a huge story of hers as well. What other specific storylines are you looking forward to seeing kind of play out on screen in these seasons if it stays faithful to the animated series? Toph. Toph. 100%. Like, I am so excited to see that character come to life because she was one of my top favorites on uh, seasons two and three and oh she's got some good stuff but yeah I think everyone's excited to see that character come to life I mean I'm pretty sure people are already fan casting like crazy right now trying to figure out um do you have any ideas or are you just like excited to see who, who it will be I'm just excited I I haven't again it's been it's all been so new that um I haven't heard anything but I'm just purely fangirling at this point and just <laughs> sharing my excitement with everybody else I know you would also say more Appa because that's yes. a character who, who you love so much I love him so much I would I do want to see personally I don't know if it will happen or not but the episode where it's heartbreaking but where he goes missing spoiler um for those who haven't seen the original but um I, I like the side adventures, him and Momo. She's <laughs> <just> so cute. <laughs> so I have to do selfishly. like a spin-off series just based on that portion <laughs> because I, I know it, it was hard for <laughs> them to kind of fit a lot into those eight episodes. So you only hope that, I mean, I'm hoping for longer episodes or more episodes um, because there's so much rich story to tell. 
Uh, what can you say about the performances of Gordon, Guy, Wendio, Dallas, Ian, and Elizabeth as young actors with an immense responsibility and how they've responded to those pressures and embodied their characters? They absolutely nailed it. Nailed it. They were the perfect casting for those roles. And they are so gracious and so mature and so professional that they've handled it beautifully. Um, it is a crazy amount of pressure as we've seen. And, but they did it so well that it's become thankfully the number one show in the world. And that has a lot to do with their performances. And um, God, I hope, I hope they take in all of that and all the love because they really do deserve it. What can you say about the fan support that you've received personally? Like, what have you seen online and what has that support meant to you? I just want to thank everybody for, um, one, watching the show. And then all the positive feedback was just really heartwarming to see because all of us felt the pressure of of doing this justice. Um, and once the show's released, it's not ours anymore. That that's how I see it anyway. It's the fans, and for them to receive that and and like what they received, it's just it's been overwhelmingly um, wonderful on my end to to see all of that. So I just want to thank them for their positivity and for watching the show. It's been really great. I know a fan was it made you and sent you um, some fan ear like fan yes, earrings. Yes, I wore like... them on my other interview. They're so beautiful, and I actually I I met her at the premiere. She is lovely and I wanted to wear them at the premiere, but I was just, it got lost in my luggage somehow. And I was like, oh my God. And I was like, I'm so sorry, but I am going to wear them on my interviews because I wanted to wear them at the premiere, but they're great. <laughs> they were so lovely. And it's such a nice like tribute to obviously your character as well. And to have that keepsake, uh, we will go through some tweets now. Avatar The Lost Airbenders live action made some points when they paid homage to Queen Kyoshi, like that's an entrance of a mother. <laughs> You've been getting a lot of these mother comments. <laughs> Are you just like soaking it all in? Because I mean, obviously, I mean, I'm from, it was a bit, I would say the generation after mine, but mother, obviously iconic female figure, but everywhere I look, it's like Kyoshi is mother. I am so, um, not trendy so when the when the mother stuff started coming i'm like i think it means something good but i looked it up because I'm like, what is it? urban dictionary <laughs> yeah thank goodness um that's very sweet that's very kind of but i have been seeing a lot of the the mother stuff um she does have like wonderful. that feminine energy which is the key part for your character yeah yeah kiyoshi in the live action is 10 out of 10 oh I don't care about anything else. Give me more of the giant hot bunny lady. <laughs> um, great. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. It is canon that Kiyoshi is a bisexual character. Um, well, her sexuality isn't her identity. It is important part of her story, some of her relationships uh, in her life. How important is that narrative, like getting to portray an LGBTQ plus character that has an impact on audiences? I think it's hugely important. Like what the show does is to have, thankfully, because the original source material was that, a, a great tapestry of diversity of all backgrounds and I'm always love is love that's it so let's just show love and it should be accepted you know like that that's point blank love is love <laughs> and it's so meaningful for fans to see like an openly queer avatar as well so I mean that's another kind of subplot storyline that I'd love to see yeah. in any kind of spinoff um, the female presence that this show has and this franchise has as well is just incredible between the characters but also the cast members now that yes. it's live action yeah it's so many powerful women in the storyline um, and it's it's fandom of the relationship between her and Rangi and I absolutely love that story it's it's one of the best and again read the novels guys it's so good <laughs> <laughs> little boy if you don't get 
get your ass. <laughs> Did I say that right? Oh, if you don't, I got it. I got it. Little boy, if you did get your, I got it. Got it. <laughs> this is me reading it for the first time. So forgive me. Um, <laughs> fair. <laughs> I mean, there were comments underneath that thread, like how mad she was. She totally ate him up. Like, she was, yeah, I'm reading them now. Not, this she was hilarious. not thrilled. She was not happy in that moment. I love the internet and how quick and witty people are. Um, this is fun. Great. Isn't Spanish. Okay. I think it says something like, in love with the diva who played Kiyoshi in the live action avatar. My God, especially after I discovered that she is just as tall. <laughs> I mean, you are tall. You're just not seven feet tall. Not seven tall. feet tall, but... I'm all right. <laughs> I guess I'm a, a little bit, but I don't know. I don't know. Um, that's that's very that's very sweet. That's very funny. Yvonne Chapman needs to be Lady Shiva. I'm so serious. I mean, hey, I would love to be. I I know that's been circulating. Um, some people have been saying that, but she's also another badass woman, and I would have no qualms with that whatsoever. So. Thank you I that. feel like it has been circulating. I think back in 2021, I know people were also saying that. But for people okay. who don't know, that's from the DC Universe, Batman. I mean, she's very much like Jalan in some ways. Yeah, yeah. She's um, like just this badass fighter warrior woman. So I, I again, yeah, no, no qualms about doing that whatsoever. As we kind of round things out, uh, your upcoming projects, Superman and Lois, you'll be playing Amanda McCoy, who is an ally to Lex Luthor, who, of course, um, Michael Cudlett's big bad this upcoming final season. I mean, what can you say about how your time on set has been so far without spoiling anything? Obviously, you'll be working closely with Michael. Yes, and he's awesome. He, from day one, made me feel so welcomed. He's such a gracious person and so kind. But then terrifying when on on screen, which is almost like you're like, how is it possible that this man who's so lovely can be so scary at the same time? <laughs> um, anyway, he's a phenomenal actor. I've had a great time with him um, and all the rest of the crew and cast are lovely human beings. And so I'm I'm just really, really excited for you guys to see what we have in store. It's going to be a really, really good way to send off the the series so exciting stuff ahead yeah and she'll also i think i read be causing trouble for the kents which is I'm not just good always for trouble this. <laughs> i'm just I know, why trouble. are you causing so much trouble i feel like a lot of these characters have this vein of but you could be you're like completely the opposite of <laughs> some of these characters that you play um, in terms of the docu series, I know you've been mentioning repping on the road with your friend Evelyn. Can you speak a bit more on that? Like, what are their plans in the immediate future to kind of put out these episodes or travel to more cities? I guess when you're not working, we would love to. Actually, Evelyn is visiting right now from New York in Vancouver, so she's here. Uh, we're going to be talking a little bit more about how we can get that going. But right now we're just editing the trailer and some of the footage that we got when we shot in New York. And we're hoping to shop it around and see if we can get a partnership going on that. Um, because for us, it's really important just to try to showcase people who've done really great things for the people in their lives and their communities to show representation in all facets. So I don't have wood around me, but knock on wood, that's something that could happen in the future. <laughs> that's great. And I know it's, um, she has the Reppin podcast, but for you, this is also like a personal passion project. So it's nice to have these creative yeah. things on the side to kind of compliment you when you're working. Yeah, absolutely. And this is definitely, like you said, a passion project for both of us. Um, and I met her on the podcast and we just became really good friends and she's one of the best human beings I've ever met. And to do this with her has always just been a dream. So. That's wonderful. Well, I look forward to seeing both of these projects when they come out, obviously Thank Superman you. Lois season four. I don't know when it's going to premiere, maybe in the fall. You don't know yet. I do think you? I don't know. I've heard maybe in the fall, but I, I don't have an exact date yet, but when I do, I'll definitely update everybody. 
I have one more question for you, our signature question. If you could be any ice cream flavor, which would you be and why? Durian. It's delicious. And I know that's very polarizing, but my mother is Singaporean and we love our durian. <laughs> so that's what I choose. <laughs> I think that that's the first durian that I've heard, but also because I'm of, sure I know it's like an, an Asian what do you know, people have their love hate relationships with. That. Yeah. Well, one of one of the people that we interviewed for Reppin was um, Christina, who owns the Chinatown ice cream factory in New York. It's one of the oldest ice cream shops in New York that has all of these flavors. And one of them was durian. It was so good. It was so good. There was another one, spoiler alert, that actually made me cry because it reminded me of my childhood. I won't spoil which one it was. Um, but the durian one was like, oh, so good. So that's anyway, your go-to. I know a lot of people are. Uh, ice cream sh yeah. shops. If they have it, of if, course. If they have it, which usually they don't. If they don't, I don't know. You might I just have to make your life. own. Oh, God. <laughs> my home would smell interesting. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I like Maybe. that answer and anything that I think reminds you of your childhood is never a wrong way to go yeah yeah for sure well thank you so much Yvonne for taking the time to chat I really appreciated it oh of course thank you so much for taking the time and hopefully we get to meet each other in Vancouver because you're here so yes maybe at around. one of those film festivals or Absolutely. local award ceremonies um but until then for all those watching you can catch Yvonne in Avatar The Last Airbender season one is out now on Netflix lots more to come from her and we will see you next time thank you Chloe thank you guys